Welcome, everybody. Welcome to, I think this is now the third uh, episode of our reproducibility study group uh, podcast. Yes. Uh, well, the second is not yet online, but uh, will be soon. And we'll try to uh, timely upload these as well, because we are going to talk about a very nice uh, topic, uh, which uh, uh, touches the core of ISMRM uh, people, which is the ISMRM challenge for next, next year. So. We are here with uh, uh, Laura Bortolotti and Sophie Schaumann. They are uh, two of the three organizers of the challenge. Uh, Laura is a postdoc at the University of Nottingham. She had a PhD at the University of Nottingham and she's a committee member of the ISMRM challenge and the big ISMRM educational series. Whereas Sophie is in Stanford, she's a postdoc and she has a doctor of philosophy from Oxford and she's the co-chair of MRI Together 22, uh, and as well a committee member of the ISMRM challenge. Maybe uh, later we'll also be joined by Maria Eugenia Caligiuri, who is uh, uh, also in the organization of the challenge, and she's in the committee of the reproducibility study group. As part of uh, the hosts, we are here. Uh, I am Francesco Santini from the Reproducibility Study Group together with uh, Efra Shimron, you know her. And then we have Mathieu Boudreau and Nadia Blostein from uh, MRM Highlights who are uh, kindly hosting us on uh, YouTube. So um, thank you very much, Laura and Sophie for accepting this invitation. I'm really, really happy that we can talk to you. Let uh, us ask you a little bit about yourselves. So uh, let's start with Laura. Um, why did you approach uh, reproducible research and uh, open science? Uh, what uh, gave you the idea? Um, so that's uh, one of the time that you need to keep a long story short, isn't it? Um, so um, I think that reproducibility is important and this is a general thing it's like since I start to be a researcher. I always try to have my result reproduced because otherwise, what's the point? Um, this year, I was uh, collaborating to uh, to make the Hammerham Highlight Journal, and I was interviewing Fernando, and um, the president, and he pointed out how much reproducibility is important in our field, and then the idea of the challenge come up in my mouth, like, well, why not asking people to reproduce each other abstract at the conference then? Let's start from that, you know, easy. Usually abstract are easy um, topic or at least short experiment or, well, not always, but um, easier than a paper, let's say so. And, and so then I contacted the reproducibility study group and they said, oh, actually, Sophie, has an idea as well. <laughs> Why not to uh, team up together and put together your idea? And so we started to work and we came up with a challenge. I didn't remember that it went like that. Uh, Sophie, <laughs> <laughs> so what about you? Uh, how did you get into reproducibility and open science? Yeah, that's a that's a hard question. I feel like during my uh, doctoral training, we were getting little bits of uh, here and there of of uh, advice on like how to make your code reproducible and stuff, and and you started to notice, or I started to notice that it's it's harder than it than it seems. Uh, and then I started learning more and more about the reproducibility crisis, and and uh, that has been highlighted in many other fields, but there hasn't been much work focusing on MRI research and how what the state of reproducibility is for us um, so I got more and more interested in that and started thinking do we have a problem do we have a reproducibility crisis um, so my idea that I kind of got connected with Laura uh, for was I wanted to kind of have a look at uh, the ISMRM community and see um, what is the state of things are we uh, are we having similar problems to like experimental psychology or not? Um, so I had this idea of kind of um, assessing reproducibility within the ISMRM, but uh, then I got connected with Laura saying she was going to run this challenge. So I thought that was a great uh, 
project to both kind of encourage people to do reproducible science, but also see uh, what challenges people are facing with, with doing um, those kinds of things. Okay, and uh, so tell us uh, a little bit more about the challenge. So probably some of the people will have heard about it already, but uh, I think it's good to repeat what it is and how do you participate? Maybe Sophie, you start and then Laura All right. can continue. Sure. I would say Laura is definitely the driving force behind this. She has been the heart and soul of, of driving the challenge. But um, yeah, I've, I've, I've helped a little bit. <laughs> um, so the challenge is um, basically open for anyone uh, within the ISMRM community. Uh, you can take an abstract from any ISMRM meeting and attempt to reproduce it. Um, the only thing that we uh, ask for you to do in order to participate in the challenge is we want to use the concept of pre-registration. We want people to register what they're gonna do before they do it um, in order to um, both kind of get people a, uh, give people a chance to try uh, pre-registration, but also to kind of keep people honest with what they're actually gonna try and, and then get more reliable results, I think. Uh, so we want people to pre-register. Uh, it's an online form. It's pretty easy to just go through. It's a bit long, but it, it forces you to think through what your plan is before you do a reproducibility study, then do the reproducibility study and um, uh, report on the results back to to the challenge and then we're um, intending to do some judging on it in terms of the quality of uh, the pre-registration and your final analysis but not uh, we're not judging the submissions based on whether the uh, final result was that the original study was reproducible or not because we want an honest um, attempt and honest results and I don't think uh, for a small reproducibility study, you can say whether the original study was good or bad or whether it's actually reproducible or not. But um, yeah, that's kind of an overview. I think Laura probably has more to say about it. I think you you gave a great summary. That's the reason why we are a good team. I'm talking a lot and you don't. And so we, we can complete each other. Um, <laughs> but no, I, I think you touched the um, all the main point of this challenge so uh, I think one of the key points to have this challenge happen is to um, have people networking because the fact that you can reproduce any abstract of any conference means that um, you you have to know the people you have to be in contact with the authors you have to ask to them can we uh, build up a team can we um, together reproduce this abstract that you submitted or other way around uh, you might have your abstract and you would like to that someone else will reproduce it so one of the part of the challenge is to create this connection strong enough to participate to the challenge but not that deep in a way that you will go into infer with the results as Sophie point out with the pre-registration um, form that's, that's the whole point basically um, so yeah, uh, there is a hand up, so I guess there is a question. Yeah, no, I just, uh, I was wondering if there's any, um, recommendation or requirement to, uh, share data and code from the, uh, replication study, um, uh, with their submission. So that we, we gave, um, completely freedom. On that, so um, the um, author sub, sub team and reproducer sub team that's the way we call it in the website they have the freedom to choose what to do because they can do different kind of reproducibility studies. So, uh, if they would like to share the data and just reproduce the analysis, that's fine. If they would like to acquire new data and do the whole process from the beginning, that's fine. Um, of course. Uh, as a committee, we cannot interfere with the fact that both the groups needs to have compatible um, 
experimental setup or things like that. Like this is one of the things they have to declare in the pre-registration, for example. So all this background part needs to be managed by the group. Um, but for the rest, they have complete freedom. So, uh, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm happy to add on to that as well. So yeah, as Laura was saying, in terms of sharing data between the, the two sub teams, it's completely up to them how much they want to share. And as long as they pre-register how much contact there's going to be between them. But we do um, have a category on the, on the judging uh, criteria on openness in terms of the reproducibility study itself should have its um, code and material and data um, shared. Uh, so that after the after the study, people can then, if they want to, reproduce the reproducibility um, and uh, the repl replication study, I should say. And um, yeah, that is one of the criteria that we intend to judge the submissions on. I have understood that you already have some submissions. Uh, uh, can you tell us a little bit about it? I, I don't know if it's a confidential information, but just paint a broad picture. Go ahead, Laura. Should I go? Yeah. Um, so, well, it's confidential. We we posted on Twitter. So I guess once it's on Twitter, it's not really confidential anymore, isn't it? Um, so we have uh, four, four teams that have submitted um, the pre-registration form and uh, they cover like four different topics. So in terms of what Sophie was saying, like have a look in general, how replication is going in the MRI um, between the MRI members. That's great. And surprisingly, we have five people looking for reproducing their abstract. So at the moment, there is more people looking for someone that will reproduce their work than a ready format team. Um, but it's great. It means that basically, potentially, we already have nine uh, abstract that are going to be reproduced. Um, now the point is how to find a match for those five. So again, we have posted on Twitter and there is uh, on the website of the challenge, there is a forum where everyone can write and type, you know, I would like to have my abstract reproducer or they could say, I would like to participate and reproduce an abstract in this topic and blah, blah, blah. So um, the forum is the way that um, uh, will help on having this networking and matching part at the moment. Um, and yeah, other than that, that have, have been a lot of rumor around the challenge, or at least at the event that I have attended recently, I have many people come to me and talk and being interesting on doing the challenge. Um, there is a bit of an issue to overcome. So some people are afraid to be judged as Sophie pointed out, we are not going to judge anyone. It's not, it's not we are going to tell you that your research is bad. You know, that's, that's not the aim. We are going to, to see how and why and why, why this is reproducible or not, but not good or bad. Um, and the other point is to have time to reproduce an abstract. So of course it, it will, to reproduce someone else's work, it will take time, but has, people have the freedom to decide how to do this reproducibility study. They can decide to spend how much time they want. If there is a clinical study over 100 patients, we do not expect to repeat the measurement over 100 patients, of course, but maybe they can decide to just reanalyze the data or they can decide to, uh, I don't know, if they have a similar, similar protocol, they, they can acquire new data and they can see the compatibility or things like that. So um, I think those, um, those were the two factors that um, I've noticed on talking with people at the recent event. Um, nevertheless, some people have overcome these things and submitted a pre-registration form. So we'll see. The deadline is in March, so there is still time. I'm, I'm still optimistic. And if, I mean, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say the same thing uh, as Laura said that, um, yeah. Uh, there's no rush uh, at the moment, at least if people are busy with ISMRM abstracts and other thing. Obviously, it would be great if you could do it before, because then you can submit to ISMRM your reproducibility study. But we're going to keep our um, pre-registration form open up until March um, next year. So 
there's there's still plenty of time to take part after the ISMRM deadline over Christmas or in the spring. Uh, can you please tell us a little bit about the abstracts that uh, people already uh, signed up for reproducing? Was it more computational or uh, phantoms oriented or hardware? Can you, can you just give us some topics? Um, so I, yeah, I've got the list. I got the list. <laughs> no, I got the list in front of me. Otherwise, I won't remember. There's no way that I will remember nine abstracts. Um, so uh, I think I think one is computational for sure. Um, and I think I need a minute to see how the other are. Um, but the one that have been offered. Uh, are on um, um, building a sequence and computational. I don't know if building a sequence fell into the category of computational. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure either, but it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. The main idea was that we keep it open for everyone, every kind of abstract and um, every kind of reproduction whether it's like you want to do the full pipeline over over again or if you want to just reanalyze the data i know one of the um abstract or one of the submissions that we have is related to reanalyzing uh, a larger um reproducibility study i think it was or mm -hmm. asl related to yeah. asl somehow <laughs> just reanalyzing the same data but going through the analysis pipeline and making sure that everything is Makes sense to the reproducibility or the reproducer, reproducer team. <laughs> There's too many R's. Um, but I think that's something that is like so valuable in our community and, and maybe isn't given enough attention normally. So I think it's great to give a platform for that. Absolutely. But um, and why would I want to participate in this challenge? So what are the advantages both as a, well, I don't remember the uh, terminology that you use, a reproducer or reproduced? <laughs> we call it the original author team. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, in terms of incentives, obviously um, one is like, reproducibility studies is a good thing as a whole for, for the community, but maybe you're not that altruistic. Um, for you yourself, obviously, you will build connections with a new lab, potentially. Um, you have the opportunity to, um, yeah, learn new techniques. And so in terms of learning things, uh, reproducing other people's work is, is very beneficial. Um, but you also, uh, because it is a competition, uh, or at least we will kind of highlight um, good things that are happening within um, within the challenge. Um, you will have an opportunity to um, share this work both uh, on the challenge website, which is like officially supported by ISMRM, and we're going to have a, a challenge focused session um, at the ISMRM next year as well at the annual meeting where we will be highlighting um, great things that have happened. Uh, within the challenge and you'll probably get a ribbon as well if you if you take part <laughs> we are like ribbons uh, um, and I guess uh, the benefit is also that uh, you will have your own implementation of a method that uh, you might be interested in and uh, and, 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 and be recognized also for re-implementing it. Uh, myself, there are a couple of uh, things that I've seen done and I would like to have them for myself, uh, but I don't have the time or incentive to, to yeah, re-implement exactly. them. If someone so. else does the work for you of like building a pipeline that is shareable because that's one mm -hmm. of the criteria that you will be judged on, then that's, that's great. Awesome. And uh, um, so maybe, Laura, what, what do you still need now? What, what are you doing, trying to obtain uh, in order to make sure that the challenge is successful or you're just waiting for submissions? Well, at the moment, we are still trying hard to promote the, uh, the initiative because even if we 
have tried a lot in the past month. There are still people that don't know what we are doing. Um, so we are still in this phase of trying to promoting what we are doing. So even if you are not interested in the challenge, but you receive an email that talk about it, please forward it to your colleague that might be interested because it, it's, already, uh, it's already an help for us. Um, and then of course, we would like to have participants. So, um, I mean, if, if a team submit the pre-registration form and at the end is not able to do the reproducibility study for any reason, for us, is already, it's already count, like it's already good because one of the things that we are looking to understand is whether there is um, interesting on doing the study, but also what are the topics that might be uh, more easy to reproduce or not. So uh, submit the pre-registration form, and but then for some reason not be able to complete the study, would it be fine as well? So it will help us to understand the interest. Um, and then of course, um, of course, well, once we have all the submission from the team, we will um, start to looking for reviewer. So has the abstract and the topic is so wide and we are not, I mean, we, we know our topic of research. We are not an expert in any topic. We are not that um, confident on uh, judging those work uh, ourselves. So when the time will be, will come, we will probably looking for reviewer that help us to understand if in this particular topic, everything that has been done in the study is following the standard procedure and, and et cetera. Um, but yeah, this will happen next spring. So we'll see. And I can see a hand. Yeah, I was wondering if there's any um, like centralized platform for discussions surrounding um, these you know, challenge submissions. You know, are, are there any forums or do you have a, yeah, the, a GitHub uh, account or things like that? No, at the moment, like Isomoram uh, gave to us a website mm -hmm. and on the website, there is the forum. So the forum of discussion of the website is the platform that we are using now. Um, right. It's possible to subscribe to the forum. So if there is any new posts, you will receive a notification that might be um, helpful or yeah. Yeah, we we uh, intend to publish um, all of the submissions uh, after after the challenge is over, including the pre-registration forms and um, uh, assessment forms uh, at the end. But we're keeping them uh, closed for now. But uh, discussion is highly encouraged uh, on the forum. Yeah, and we are going to put the. Uh... A uh, link to the forum in the description of this video, of course. Um, uh, if you guys don't mind, I think uh, we'll uh, come back to the challenge uh, uh, maybe later at the end for a final call. Uh, but I would like to uh, broaden a little bit the scope uh, more into the pure reproducibility area. So you mentioned a few times uh, the uh, pre-registration that is important for, for the challenge. Uh, um, why do you, did you, wh why did you decide that you wanted the studies pre-registered and why is it uh, important in general? So yeah. Sophie, you can start. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so pre-registration is this tool uh, that's been developed for reproducible research. Um, and it's been shown to have a, a bunch of different benefits. One is just, um, really distinguishing between hypothesis driven research when you have a hypothesis say i think i will get the same results <laughs> as um, the original study um uh and exploratory research so um yeah it kind of prevents you from um building a narrative after after you've seen your results um so that is one thing, but um, it's also been shown to be helpful in terms of just making a good plan for yourself before you do the research uh, is generally seen as uh, important. 
And um, we thought that for the challenge, it was um, appropriate to do pre-registration because in a reproducibility study, you're trying to answer kind of a very simple question. Is this, uh, are my results in agreement with uh, the original study? Um, and we, yeah, it's, it's a way to make sure both for yourself and for uh, someone that's reading about your research uh, to um, be honest about what you were originally intending to do and then what you actually did. Like, if you do something other than what you uh, pre-registered, you know, you're openly taking kind of research and degrees of freedom, which can skew your results. But as long as you're open about that, I think that's very fair and someone else can do a more rigorous study about uh, those kinds of things later. Sorry, I don't know if that was a bit rambly. But... Yeah. Oh, I, I think that's really interesting because, um, you know, I think MRI as a field or like the ICMRM community as a field has focused a lot on, you know, method developments over the years and, you know, method developments a lot of times can be exploratory and specifically like ICMRM abstract. So it's interesting that, you know, somebody might've published an abstract that was an exploration that didn't have a pre-plan. And now the second person is trying to pre-register and, and reproduce that. So you, you get kind of from both ends um, to, to see if you can uh, reproduce the paper with a pre-registration. Um, yeah, it's an interesting dynamic um, reproducing a, an abstract that way, specifically for a field. Yeah, and I think that's that's what the field needs uh, because it, I think it's great that we have exploratory research showing something new, but a lot of the time you are then comparing your method with some established method. Not always, maybe you come up with something that uh, has never been done before or nothing equivalent has been done before and it's great to present that as such but then yeah when you're validating your method against another method you should be able to say beforehand how you're going to val uh, validate it um, because otherwise there's a risk of just kind of choosing the metric that gives you the the most convenient story or omitting um, the bit that didn't quite work or didn't fit into your narrative um, because uh, yeah, we're we're simple. We're only human, and uh, um, writing a narrative for a paper is very important. And um, and similarly for abstracts, because they're so short, you have to kind of get the story across very easily, or like in a simple way. So you can't go into all the caveats. Whereas when you pre-register, you can say this is what I intended to do, and then when you present the results afterwards, you can say actually, these are actually caveats that we noticed when we did the study, rather than, oh, this was what we planned to do all along. Yeah, if I, if I can add, um, I uh, present my results recently, and for, for the first time, I said, well, why not to add a, one slide in my presentation that just talk about how I reproduce my measurement over 20 volunteer? Um, it was, I don't know, I never saw a presentation specifically have dedicated like one minute on reproducibility, but this time I say, ah, oh, I will do it. Um, I think it was well welcomed because it explained partially what I've done like clearly. And if anyone else in the audience was looking to reproduce my measurement, they already got an idea now. So I don't know what the outcome of the challenge we are running will be, but if, I, if people in the future will start to be a bit more open about their work and even like introduce one slide on how to reproduce my result in their presentation, that would be amazing, you know. But we'll see. Yeah, I, I totally agree. This is, uh, these are very important topics and uh, uh, I'm really glad that uh, a lot of people are getting interested in reproducibility in a very broad sense. I think reproducibility started uh, mostly as uh, open source tools uh, and uh, now it's really embracing a, a wide variety of topics. Um, now that you are, you've been in the community for a while, uh, uh, I guess, uh, what is your take? What is the status of the reproducibility in uh, our MRI community. Do you have a feeling for that? Laura, what do you think? I think that 
the reason, one of the reasons why I was hoping to run this challenge was exactly to have an answer about that. Because the community and the topics we touch are so wide, so broad. So I, I know in the field, in my field, like in emotion correction, we are talking about reproducibility a lot. And there have been some abstract, for example, this year, uh, focus on how to reproduce, I don't know, head movement only. If I, if I acquire the head movement of a person two times or between two different person, how can I reproduce exactly the same movement or things like that? Um, so I know what's the state of the art in my topic, but I don't know in general in the community. So that's to see the outcome of this challenge, hopefully to with a lot of participants, would be really interesting and it will answer to your question actually. Yeah, um, I think as Laura said, it's it's really hard to tell because there hasn't really been research looking into uh, um, the state of reproducibility within our field or our very broad field. But uh, from personal experience with like, yeah, um, in my in my part of MRI, which is mainly um, um, uh, imagery construction, there's a lot of tools that are coming up, open source tools and stuff, but also a lot of the time you will read a paper, be like, this sounds really cool. How can I do it myself? And there's not always code available. There's not always a uh, fine enough description of what was actually done uh, in the text, or you have to dig into it really deep or contact the original authors. Um, so the general feeling, I think, is that in terms of methods reproducibility there is still work to be done um, and in terms of results reproducibility there's also uh, a bit of a feeling like you should take some of, of any results that are presented with a grain of salt because you don't know how much uh, tweaking has been done to make that specific method work and there's kind of no way of knowing that uh, until you try it yourself. I think it's a very important distinction that you make here. And uh, now I would actually like to flip the table and uh, ask Mathieu, because uh, he has a very uh, yeah, very good feeling of the status of uh, uh, the reproducibility, especially, at least in terms of uh, open source tools uh, that are published in uh, MRM and uh, in, in our community journal. So. I would like to ask Mathieu exactly what is your feeling over the last few years? Uh, have the journal or the methods published become more reproducible in the sense of open source and open data? And also maybe more difficult to answer, is open source a guarantee of reproducibility? Um, so I, I guess I'll start with the first part. Um, I think the status is that um, the MRI field is improving in terms of openness. Um, I'd, I'd like to view it almost like a like a, a moving train. Like, you know, for years, people have built these labs and these internal tools and are, are used to using their tools and maybe not sharing and have a fear of sharing. And I, and I think it's taking some turnaround of like the younger generation students and new PIs starting new labs that are adopting some of these new um, resources. And I'm seeing that in, in the MRM journal um, with, with more and more uh, papers sharing um, code data. Um, an another part that's giving pressure from that is, is definitely from um, some, um, some nations or continental groups that are demanding more openness uh, in publication as well. Um, and that's different depending on which part of uh, the world that you're in, but there's definitely some pressure. I think one thing that's lacking is um, proper recognition um, for work done when you're when you're sharing code. So, you know, if, if you're sharing open source data and code, you might not get, you know, extra funding to do that. Um, or credit when you're applying for, you know, tenureship. And so I think there's still some pieces of puzzle missing to really give that final push, but it, it's definitely improving. Um, now, is, is openness a, a, or transparency a, a guarantee of reproducibility? No, um, I, I don't think so. Um, it, it improves the likelihood that somebody can attempt to reproduce your work. I think if you're if you don't share anything, it will definitely make it more difficult for other groups who 
either reproduce your work or adopt it um, and then cite your works. So I think it's, we've seen specifically for compressed sensing, uh, which I, th I think for me, it was one of the first papers that I'd seen that had, um, you know, shared a lot of code and data. Um, it was really, really, really quickly adopted because people could just, uh, you know, take the code, test it out and then implement it locally. Um, so I think sharing definitely improves your chances of having impact uh, in the field. Thank you. And uh, um, I would like now to uh, have a shout out to uh, MRI Together. It's, uh, it's not uh, exactly a nice MRM uh, initiative, but uh, I think it has impacted our community last year and uh, this year it's uh, continuing uh, and uh, really looking forward to, uh, to seeing that, to participating in that. So Sophie, you are in the committee. How is it coming along? Yeah, so MRI Together, the workshop that we'll be holding in um, in December this year, it's um, coming along nicely. We're in the process of inviting speakers and moderators um, at the moment. We also have our um, registration form is open, so you can register. Uh, it's free to register. And yeah, I, I'm really excited for, um, for when it comes around because we have a, a really exciting lineup of speakers. Uh, covering a range of topics from uh, open source data um, and and reproducibility me uh, methods in, in in all of MRI from from data acquisition to data processing and and everything in between and um, and we also have a new focus this year that we didn't have as much last year which is on inclusivity and openness not just in terms of open data and open um, open science, but also openness to um, doing good research in terms of good for the researchers themselves, inclusive and and uh, and that angle of things, which I think fits really well within within the, the same space. And you have a very diverse uh, uh, committee as well, no? Uh, who are uh, we, your we uh, mates? <laughs> We've tried to spread out our committee uh, across the globe because it's a fully uh, like global workshop. Um, and part of why I wanted uh, when I was uh, trying to put together the committee uh, together with my uh, coach MO was that we wanted people in kind of across the globe because we want to have committee members that are available to be around for all the sessions in all the time zones. Uh, the sessions are going to run approximately every five hours for uh, three days. So basically, whenever you feel like learning some MRI, you can uh, just jump in on, onto the platform, whether it's in the middle of the night or when you should be doing work during the day or or whenever you can, you can join in. And all the sessions will also be recorded so you can catch up if if you don't want to be up in the middle of the night. Yeah, and it's really spread out. So what time do you actually meet when you meet the committee? I'm really curious about that. <laughs> uh, we have a weekly meeting. We alternate between two times. Uh, one that is better for some people and, and the others. I actually only tend to attend every other week because one of them is at 6 a.m. for me. Uh, but um, but the, the later meeting I can attend. Um, and yeah, we've kind of said we have these two times uh, every other week. If it's convenient for you, come every week. If if it's more convenient to come every other week, come every other week. Um, and we have a Slack channel as well, so we can talk uh, asynchronously as well. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I <laughs> realized I was not muted before. Um, yeah, um, it's it's amazing, and it, I think it, you're teaching us how to really be inclusive and uh, uh, work around our own uh, schedules to uh, to work with colleagues uh, around the globe. Um, so congratulations! Do you already have some abstracts? Uh, I saw that you uh, had uh, a deadline, and uh, is it now uh, extended? Yeah, we we have uh, as of yesterday. I think we had uh, more more than fifteen submissions, uh, but the deadline's going to be have, has been extended. So we have another ten days up until the twenty third to um, get get your abstract in, promote your open source, reproducible research, whatever uh, MRI related um, uh, research you're doing. Um, 
but yeah, uh, so we have 16, I think, uh, submissions so far. We'll obviously be going through them and make sure that everything's relevant, but they're not going to be uh, reviewed. Or we're not going to have a cutoff. We're just going to, anyone that does do uh, stuff in the um, open and reproducible research uh, space uh, will get a platform to uh, present. Uh, the format's going to be a three to five minute video uh, during the conference. So I submitted mine. From what you say, I have good chance that it's going to be accepted. Uh, have you guys submitted yours yet, Laura, uh, Mathieu, Nadia? Okay, well, you have 10 days left. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think uh, we are uh, getting to, uh, to the close. I would uh, like to hear from uh, Laura again. Uh, sorry, sometimes I call you Laura because we're both... Uh, Italian origin. Sometimes I call you Laura because we are speaking English. Uh, hope you That's don't fine. mind. I, I, I guess you're used to it by now, aren't you? Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, what is, um, we, we've talked already a little bit about uh, reproducibility and the status. Uh, have you found, have you encountered uh, uh, in your um, experience uh, some uh, um, occasions where reproducibility was a problem. Maybe you tried to reproduce something and you couldn't or you would have liked and you couldn't find the proper information. What do you, um, some negative example in contrast to the positive ones that we've heard before? Well, I think I'm at the early stage of my career, so maybe I didn't have enough occasion to come across that. Um, I'm quite methodic as a researcher. So when I acquire some data in the lab and et cetera, I tend to write down a lot. So I don't want to say that every time I would like to reproduce my measurement, every time I succeed. But if I don't, usually there is some experimental error or something like that on the background that I might have not noticed at first and then I noticed the second time. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm, I'm a bit gutted because as organizer, I cannot participate to the challenge. And there are so many abstracts I would like to reproduce, but you know, it would be a bit cheating. So <laughs> we, cannot, we cannot participate to the challenge as a committee. That's yeah. not going to happen. Um, You're still yeah. allowed to do reproducible work without uh, submitting to the challenge. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, but, but yeah. you should all submit to the challenge now. And has to MRI to together. <laughs> and and MRI together. together. Um, no, and actually, you touched uh, uh, very, very briefly, but a very important topic that uh, it is very important to all of us who are in reproducibility. The first person that is going to reproduce your results is yourself. And so uh, this is uh, probably one of the greatest incentives to work reproducibly because uh, uh, in a few months, uh, some reviewer will ask you to redo the figures uh, with the new data. And uh, if you are not uh, properly reproducible, it's going to be hard. So this is uh, uh, thank you for this uh, uh, important take home message. OK, guys, uh, um, I think uh, with um, talked quite a lot already. Uh, we don't want to, uh, to bore our uh, listeners too much. I would like to conclude though with uh, yeah, with the last appeal for the reproducibility challenge, a uh, couple of more words, uh, some uh, inspiring words uh, about uh, the challenge, Laura. Inspiring. <laughs> oh, I'm not ready for that. Toffee, are you ready? I need a minute. <laughs> I can give it a go. Um, yeah, uh, I think the the sentence that's really stuck with me uh, that we've used both when we first came up with this challenge and and in promoting it is that in order for research to have any meaning, uh, it has to be reproducible. Otherwise, what are we doing? So I would use the challenge as an opportunity to embrace that and to try these methods uh, to improve our community as a whole and your own research. As I said before, we are a great team because she came out with the best answer. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree, Sophie. It's, 
that's the best inspiring and take a home message. We are all researchers, we are all scientists, and to have any meaning, science has to be reproducible. So let's start to take a step in this direction and hopefully never stop. I totally agree. And uh, I thank you very much for uh, yeah this uh, inspiring message. So I would really like to uh, invite uh, everybody who is listening to this to visit the uh, uh, challenge forum page that is uh, going to be uh, in the description, as I said. Um, we have talked about uh, a reproducibility uh, in MRM. I think uh, Mathieu uh, has recently published an editorial with uh, Nicola and uh, Peter Jezzard. Uh, we're going to put a link to that as well, hopefully. Um, we'll give an idea uh, to our listeners about the, the status of the field. And um, yes, with this, uh, I think I would like to uh, thank uh, our guests, uh, uh, Laura and uh, Sophie. It was really great talking to you. And uh, the MRM Highlights team, uh, Nadia and Mathieu, uh, thank you very much for the exciting conversation, for being here. And uh, thank you all to our listeners for uh, bearing with us and uh, see you next time. <laughs>